I think we can start at least with some announcements and then we, in five minutes or so, we start also with a presentation. Um, yeah, I wanted to have some, some information for students, uh, for the, the attendance and also the poster at the end to get the credits and so on. So we, uh, you should have received already the email with the link to this page and hopefully read it already. Um, so there are some information about how to do a poster, how to do it in a good way, um, in which format is expected to be, which is PDF, and by when it's well, all written there. Um, important is to pick a topic by April 14th, and then to write an email to Undine um, saying, I picked this topic and I would like to do a poster on this, um, on this topic. And then if you don't specify uh, someone from the team who should advise you, we'll, we will come up with someone from our team to give you some advices about any question that you might have about doing the poster. Um, so this website is also printed and attached to the attendance list that we circulate now. Um, I think I said it already last time, but there is 85% um, of attendance mandatory to get the credits, which means you can miss two yeah. seminars among the nine of them. Um, and there is also an additional um, sheet only for students where you should write um, your name and attach it to the, to the emails and write it clearly because we had some troubles, you know, uh, figuring out the right spelling for the names. So if you could just, you know, write your name very clearly and then say, this is my email. So there are all the emails listed here. Those that we got, and you should just you know, say my name and this is the number of the email. And apart from this, um, I'm really glad to introduce uh, Yannick Hane, who will present today about creating a dynamic grammar of ancient Greek. He's based in Leuven at the Catholic University and is working together with Tom Van Hal. So I'll just leave it to you. So good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of Digital Classicist Berlin for uh, inviting me to uh, this lecture, to this lecture series. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about an ongoing research project at the University of Leuven, which is supervised by Professor Toon van Hal, and in which I am a collaborator. Um, this research project is actually an educational project. What does this mean? It is a project not necessarily aimed at producing new insights about the Greek language, but rather at finding new ways of transmitting recent insights about Greek linguistics and the Greek language to uh, students and to um, university level education. Before explaining to you what a dynamic grammar actually is, I would like to talk to you about the institutional background and the linguistic reasons or the scientific reasons why we have decided to create a new Greek grammar. Now, about um, 10 years ago, at all Flemish universities, um, language education was, uh, was merged into one single degree. So there was no longer a classics degree, but students could choose to combine Latin or ancient Greek with a modern language. This had the consequence that uh, students of ancient Greek also had a number of uh, linguistic uh, gen or general linguistics courses. So um, this contrasts with the German system uh, of Altphilologie or the, the Anglo-Saxon system of classics. Um, so we needed to find a new way of incorporating linguistics in Greek language education. As a um, linguistic model, we have chosen for uh, functional linguistics and especially uh, functional grammar, which is um, a form of functional linguistics developed by the, um, by the Dutch linguist Simon Dick and his uh, pupil Kees Hengeveld. Functional linguistics um, sees language as a system, a system in which there are three types of functions. Pragmatic functions concerning interpersonal relations, syntactic functions 
which concern um, mainly the viewpoint of, um, of the speaker and semantic functions which express the actual content of the state of affairs. Next to these th three types of functions there obviously is morphology and phonology as rather form-based um, form elements in language. If we consider these three types of functions and then the form categories and we look at, a, um, at the structure of a traditional grammar then we see the following structure. Most uh, grammars of ancient languages and also of modern languages are structured in this way. They start from a morphological category. For example, they'll start to explain the usage of the dative. Then they'll go on to a syntactic category. In this case, for example, satellites or non-obligatory constituents. And they'll end by explaining to you uh, which kind of meanings are expressed by the dative. For example, cause, means, etc. On the other hand, there are other ways of structuring a grammar. You could also say, in grammar B, you could start from the semantic level and explain how cause is expressed in ancient Greek. In other words, how you translate because or because of in ancient Greek. Move on to the morphological level and then to the satellites or to the syntactic level. The same um, applies for grammar C, in which you start from the syntactic level, go to, on to the semantic and the morphological types. So, as I said, most classical languages use model A. The main reason for this is that um, students of, of classical language are expected to give receptive or to acquire receptive rather than active language skills. They have to learn how to read ancient texts and not really how to speak ancient languages. The disadvantage of this model is that it doesn't necessarily give a good, um, a good insight into how language works. Because students, yeah, of course students will, give, will be able to give you a list of all the usages of the dative, but they won't necessarily know what uh, all the means are to express cause in ancient Greek. So, as I said, um, the, the system we just saw um, doesn't really reflect complexity in language. It's not really dynamic because printed grammars necessarily hold on to a, a strict, uh, strict structure. And finally, it is bound to a specific level of knowledge. Um, what do I mean by this? When someone writes a grammar, he writes it or she writes it, for a specific public. It can be a grammar for high school students, it can be a grammar for advanced researchers, but there's never a dual use. Now, we've tried to address the problems uh, we've just discussed by creating a dynamic structure based upon what we've called tags. We distinguish four types of tags. First, uh, first of all, form tags, basically morphology. Uh, second of all, content tags, which uh, combine elements from semantics and uh, pragmatics. And finally, hierarchy tags, which combine elements from syntax and pragmatics. We've uh, decided to split up pragmatics because pragmatics combines on the one hand elocutionary forces like, uh, for example, giving an order, uh, and on the other hand, um, constituents that aren't necessarily on a sentence level, but rather say something about the utterance as a whole. That's why we've decided to, to split uh, pragmatics up. The fourth uh, type of tags we are distinguishing are study level tags, uh, which indicate that the specific rule is, um, is supposed to be known by students of a first year uh, degree or, of, uh, or by master students, for example. Students will be able to navigate through this dynamic structure using faceted search, which I will demonstrate to you later on. And each tag will also, also uh, get an own page. You will probably have figured out that it, this will be uh, a web application. Well, uh, in this web, applica web application, each tag will get an own page with a definition and with some um, general linguistic background. Let's now look at one specific uh, grammatical rule. Hina plus the subjunctive expressing go as a satellite, satellite meaning non-obligatory constituent. 
To this we can assign the morphological tags hina and the subjunctive, the semantic tag go, and the syntactic tag satellite. So this is the basic structure of our grammar. Now let us look at one particular, um, one particular paragraph or grammatical rule and see which elements are involved. So this is one of our uh, grammatical rules. I've translated it into English for you because the, uh, the actual grammar will be in Dutch because it will be used in, uh, in education in Leuven. So every um, grammatical rule will start with a title, with a fixed uh, structure, um, starting from the form, then going on to uh, the semantics and finishing with syntax. The first thing students will see underneath uh, the title will be what we've called a succinct example. This is a short sentence uh, which clearly illustrates the rule um, we are uh, trying to explain. They will often be from uh, authors like Menander, uh, like in this case, because we also try to give some content uh, to the students so they don't have to learn uh, sentences by heart, like he went uh, to the river with 50,000 soldiers or something like that. This uh, sentence like this uh, is a bit more interesting. The second thing they will see when, they, uh, when they're learning a um, rule will be the level tag, in this case one, because this rule is supposed to be known by first-year students. Then the grammatical tags, which we've discussed before. The, the actual rule, which is a bit more extensive than the title, um, and in this case it includes ofra, uh, which is an epic um, word. Underneath the rule, um, we'll find supplementary information. This uh, information is um, organized into a number of categories, um, syntax, lexical information, uh, frequency information, etc. Um, you see, yeah, it's not always as much as it was in the syntax uh, case. It's in the case of indicators, that's just one sentence or two. We've um, decided to to keep this, this uh, supplementary information separate from the actual definition because in classical grammars you often get a very long definition and it's very hard to see the essence of, uh, of the rule. Then underneath will be the, the example sentences. Uh, in this case I've only translated four, uh, three of them but um, the actual paragraph contains a lot more sentences. Uh, why have we chosen to use that many example sentences? Uh, it's basically to illustrate every kind of, um, of syntactic uh, element we are uh, explaining in the supplementary information. So also this is a difference uh, compared to traditional written printed grammars. Now we've seen uh, all the, the visible elements of a, uh, of a paragraph. We can look at, an, at invisible uh, metadata. Each um, paragraph is assigned to a unique identifier. This is important because not only it allows us to link each grammatical rule to the, the tags and the examples um, involved, but also because it could um, it could be, serve as a link between each paragraph in our grammar and an, uh, an equivalent paragraph in another grammar that students might know from high school, for example. So they can easily find their, uh, their rules back. Um, also, we've included a number of bibliographical references for each paragraph. Um, our main source is um, is Emilio Crespo uh, and others actually, um, uh, Syntaxis del Griego Classico. This is a recent syntax of Greek, um, which includes all types of modern uh, insights into uh, language and into linguistics. Um, other recent reference works we are using are, for example, uh, Albert Rijksbaron's Syntax and Semantics of the Verb in Classical Greek. Um, apart from these recent reference works, we've decided to use also traditional grammars like those of Smith and Goodwin 
not only because they are available online, but also because they include a large number of examples, which is very interesting um, to include them in our, uh, in our own grammar. Um, also, to the examples, um, a number of um, metadata elements are, uh, are added. Each uh, example is assigned, again, a unique identifier, um, which will be important for, uh, for the actual website, because each, um, like this, each example also gets an own page. Um, and these unique identifiers also link, uh, serve as links to more than one grammatical room, because one sentence can obviously include several syntactic phenomena. Um, finally, the identifiers are important because they allow us to use these examples as exercises, as exercise material in an application, which I will also demonstrate to you um, later on in the presentation. Now, uh, on the actual, in the actual application, online application, uh, an automatic link to the Perseus uh, database will be provided so that a student can, uh, can look up the sentence in its original context and maybe get a better idea of what is meant. Um, for future prospects, there are obviously uh, possibilities for links to um, metadata in Perseus catalog or in Wikidata uh, or Trismegistos, um, just to give you some examples. Now, um, we've seen what one paragraph looks like and which elements are assigned to one paragraph. Let us now look at the larger macro structure of our grammar. We've constructed our, uh, our grammar application in a FileMaker Pro database, which is a relational database. Um, the importance of a relational database it consists in a number of elements. First of all, it allows us to uh, create the links between paragraphs, examples, etc. Um, but secondly, it also uh, helps us avoid typing mistakes or other mistakes because uh, a lot of our data can be automatically calculated. For example, the, uh, the links to the Perseus database. Finally, it allows for exports not only to Drupal, which will be the, the uh, basis for our website, but also to Word, because um, we will construct, we will also edit a, uh, a printed version of this, uh, of this grammar. Yeah, what you see here is the, the actual structure of our database. There's a small, uh, small part missing, but that's involved with, uh, with morphology, so it's not really relevant for this presentation. Okay, um, after we constructed the, um, the database in our uh, FileMaker application, we will um, we'll use an importer tool to, um, to import it into our uh, Drupal website. Um, yeah, so this, these um, pictures show you the actual working of the importer tool. Um, there are separate importers for rules, tags, examples and bibliography um, because these, these rules and the examples each get a known, a known web page uh, as well as the text actually. So then we have to match FileMaker and Drupal fields, export the whole thing to Drupal and then we get our website. Um, yeah, our tags, um, yeah, just, just on a technical note, uh, what we call tags in Drupal is called taxonomies, but it's basically the same, the same thing. Um, we are b using a fairly basic uh, Drupal website to which our uh, Drupal consultant Hans Koppens has added a custom-made uh, faceted search tool. Um, also, we have constructed an, uh, an adaptive user interface which is optimized for touch screens because we think that students nowadays will not only consult uh, the website on their, their PCs, but also on their phones, on their tablets, um, or other uh, devices. So. Okay. Now I will shortly demonstrate how our faceted search works. Um, this is not the definitive, uh, the definitive layout, but it's, it's clearer to use this, I think, uh, to demonstrate faceted search. 
Um, when students arrive on the, the web page, on the home page of our website, they will be asked to, um, to use one of these four types of filters. There are form, content, hierarchy, and level, study level filters, as we said before. For example, they'll uh, select study level number four. Study levels are uh, cumulative, con and in contrast with other uh, kinds of filters, because a student of, uh, of the master program will also see, um, will also see rules used uh, in the first year. Afterwards, they can select a second tag, a third, etc., etc., until they find the, uh, the grammatical rule that, I, that they are searching for. Now, how will this application be implemented in classroom learning? How will this uh, be used uh, during actual classes? Um, we've gone out of the principle of blended learning. Blended learning is a fairly recent concept which tries to combine, on the one hand, uh, classroom learning in, in a fairly classical way, and on the other hand, self-study at home. So our students will not only be explained what these rules mean in class, but they, also, they will also um, be asked to uh, read texts um, at home and to just discover new rules, uh, new aspects of the Greek language by looking them up in the, in the online grammar tool. So there are actually three aspects to our um, application. First of all, it's a reading grammar. It's a reading grammar because when reading a classical uh, Greek text, uh, students will, um, will be able to use a form and the hierarchy tags to find out which phenomenon they are actually dealing with um, when reading a Greek text. Secondly, it's a learning grammar. Uh, for this purpose, the level tags are very important. So first year students don't get to see a very obscure Homeric phenomenon, for example. And thirdly, it's a reference grammar. For this purpose, content and hierarchy tags are important. Um, and this type of, uh, of this, or this aspect will be important, for example, when uh, students are asked to translate a sentence from Dutch into classical Greek. So if, uh, if the Dutch, Dutch sentence contains, for example, omdat, meaning because in English, they can look up how you express course in ancient Greek. A second uh, aspect of uh, classroom, uh, classroom implementation uh, is the exercise module. Now I have to say that this exercise module will not be integrated in the, in the website application for the simple reason that our web application is uh, released under a Creative Commons license and Edumatic, the software we are using, is not, uh, is not free software. So it will be integrated in the Blackboard learning platform, um, which is called Toledo at, at uh, Leuven University. So students will, will be able to access it through that. Edumatic is a, is a great software for several reasons. First of all, it allows for a, a large number of, um, of exercise types. There will be drop-down exercises, fill-in-the-gap exercises, etc. Um, and also, it allows the, the teachers to, uh, to access the data, data about the performance of one specific student. So, you, so teachers can monitor how their students are doing um, in the exercises. Let's look at one specific uh, exercise. The, there is, still is a problem with the fonts, but that will be solved in a, in a later phase. Um, so the question here is, fill in the right form uh, of Etello in the first person plural and for Beomai in the first person plural again. So if they answer this question correctly, students will get this. They will get a uh, translation in which the relevant passages are uh, underlined. And if they want to know which uh, grammatical rule is involved, they can click the balloons next to each, uh, next to each field. Um, and like that, they will get a link to the website. Right now, it's just a link to Wiktionary, but it, it will be a, a link to our website. 
We will also create morphological exercises, not only syntactic exercises, like in this case where um, students are asked to analyze uh, the form person, um, and they're asked to indicate the correct diathesis, mood, tense, person, case, number and um, gender. Again, if they do it correctly, they'll get the translation of the sentence so they can know what they're actually um, analyzing. To uh, end my presentation, I would like to talk about future prospects. Um, this project is a two-year project which ends in uh, October 2015 and um, therefore our, uh, our time is limited. We can only um, make the, the application work as it's being presented today. But um, our, uh, our grammar will be available under a Creative Commons license, license so information exchange is a possibility. Furthermore, um, there is a possibility for adaptations, for example, um, adding a specific level, uh, level tag for history students. So uh, they will only see uh, rules relevant for historical authors, for example. So thanks to the dynamic structure, lots of, um, of additions are, uh, are possible without encumbering the grammar too much. So thank you for your attention. Um, I yeah, I'd happy to receive your be happy to receive your questions, and to um, demonstrate shortly demonstrate the website. If one arrives on the on the homepage of the website, one sees two possibilities. Either you can look for a specific term. I will just look for uh, something. I don't know. Yeah, this is subjunctive in Dutch. And then they'll just get a list of, uh, of rules involving the subjunctive. Yeah, this, this layout is not definitive, so it's still work in progress. The second possibility will be to, um, to filter based on these tags. For example, syntactic level. We want to know something about um, onderwerp, subject. Oops, subject, then you'll get two different rules and then the other, uh, the other filters disappear because you can't filter any more than this. You can remove then, then remove this filter. We can select, for example, the form. Yeah, it's not really, the, the content isn't really uh, up to date. But for example, this form and then study level four and then you'll end up with two different rules. So as I said, the, the content on this website is a couple of months old, so it's not really up to date, but it gives you an idea.